there will be Apple reviews that will be like, oh my gosh, these girls' perspectives are so wise. They give salt of the earth vibes, such rich content and quality. And then there will be (laughs) reviews that are like, if Uncut Gems was a podcast, it would be this. (laughs) What is Uncut Gems? (laughs) Oh my gosh, Bethany. TikTok, summer 2021, Julia Fox. I showed her to you. She's the one that does like the crazy black eyeliner. Yeah. Um, it went, you just showed her to me like a few weeks ago. Because you, because Ashley Vi did her makeup. Yeah, and you but didn't I didn't know. see that uncut James I know, thing. you missed the whole freaking thing. Basically, it's just like- A meme of a Valley Girl Stupid, yeah. Basically, we just sound uneducated and like Valley Girl. But then we get like also the, we get like both. You know what I mean? And we, we are, are both. both. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was Josh Safdie's muse when he wrote Uncut Jazz. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, things like right. that. Do you know what I mean? Like, things like that. Like, <laughs> things as such. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, What were we even saying? Who said that? Things as such as like, oh, that was a pageant interview. What in the world? It's like, what kind of freaking <laughs> social media? It's like, um, how do you think the world can achieve peace or something like that? And she's like, as if, as though, the world, as such things like. What? <laughs> okay, we need to come back to the fact that Joe Jr. just died. And yeah. we're literally not on this planet. <clears throat> we need to talk about the Kennedy siblings. Episode six. Welcome to Blood and Business. I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Okay, so the controversy in episode five with Joe Jr., was he a Nazi, was he not a Nazi, all of that kind of conspiracy. I feel like you get clarity on that in this episode with Joe's actions. It had been a few years, like a kind of a lot of years. He went in 33 or something like that, 30. Yeah. It was in the like the early 30s. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't Jack went in the, 37. I didn't realize the gap was so And I think it was long. like five years. Yeah. Well, like that 30, makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And he even, grew up. Yeah. Got well, a first dose of, all, of life. He grew up. Second of all, Hitler became Hitler in the, yeah. in the meantime. Oh so through Joe Jr.'s actions in episode six, where he decides to go off to war and decides that that's what's necessary to stop the evil that is going on in Germany. And in the world at this point, he gives his life yeah. to stop it, to try and help, to, to try and put a drop in the bucket of helping good versus evil. Yeah. And he chose his side. And he, it, from his actions, there's no way you can't see that he recognized the evil. Yes. And decided that that was wrong. And, and it was important or a, a dangerous enough that he had to do something about it. Yeah. And he hated it enough for himself to do something about right. it. And it bothered him enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah it bothered just... him enough personally, right? Because yeah, there are freaking wars happening all the time that none of us are freaking yeah. fighting for. Like, of course it's evil, mm-hmm. but do does I care it offend enough? me enough? Yeah. Does it bother me? Bother me enough? Yeah. Make me uncomfortable enough? And like we said, yes, of course he, ha- he had to fight in the war most likely. He would have been drafted, but he could have been a paper pusher. He could have fought however long he needed to he also maybe could've... stay an extra little term and then go home. He stayed again and again. He also went and he early. Stayed. And he like stayed. He did not have to go because yeah. he, he could have bought himself another year to become a lawyer, to finish law school. Yep. And then went. Then went and been more of a, the intelligence. Paper pusher, decision maker. I'm important. I know what's going on. I know politics. Yeah, I went to Harvard. My dad it was the ambassador of Great Britain. Yep. I'm way too important to be out there they, risking my life. Both Jack and Joe Jr. pulled strings and used their favor mm. and influence to get into combat. They could have so easily used their power and influence and network of people to get into intelligence jobs and to be in safer positions that would still have been great for their career right. and maybe even better for their career. I mean- mm. Being better a for war Joe's. hero. Yeah. yeah. You probably couldn't get better than that. But well, it could have been better for Joe. He was freaking he be alive. He died. Yeah. yeah. He was actively and very extremely preparing for his future when he died. And that's what was such a shock to Jack. He was the number one kid who was saying, 
this is mine. I want to do this. Yeah. I'm going to do this. Anything I can I can grab and take, I'm going to go and take it. Give it to me. Right. More so than Jack. Mm-hmm. So you cannot say, oh, he just had to fight for, uh, as like default or it didn't really matter what the war was about. He was just going to fight for his country. Mm, I don't think so. He was way too opinionated for that crap. I really do think that he he and all of the Kennedys needed to feel like it was worth it in order to participate, especially at the level that they participated. But you see in letters from Jack and Joe Jr. that they came to the conclusion that, no, this is very necessary and I am happy to be a part of it. I am grateful to be a part of this solution. Yeah. Because I think Jack said, Roosevelt said, this thing is bigger than you and me. Mm -hmm. As Roosevelt said, yeah. It's, this it's global. Bigger. And so therefore I will go. The thing is, no excuses. What Joe Jr. said in 1933 was absolutely horrific and evil, point blank period. I do think when he died, he was a different person and people do change and people do evolve and grow and transform. And I think that Joe Jr. was a different person when he gave his life to fight evil than he was when he said evil. Okay, speaking a little bit more on Joe Jr.'s character, there's that quote. I feel like I'm talking about fireworks to a man who's valiantly trying to disarm an atom bomb before some like important deadline. Yeah. And I feel like a freaking child. <laughs> yeah. He was just so serious. And I feel like that really paints a good picture of he how Joe Jr. was. Yes, mission. he was, he felt so responsible and burdened, burdened with, yeah, whatever issue was in front of him and- is that a little bit narcissistic? Yes. I always question this about myself. Is it narcissistic that I think that I can help someone ever? Yeah, I kind of is. Thinking that I could help someone. Doesn't that mean, like, isn't that a little bit egotistical? Yes. But so what? But it doesn't mean that, that you it's can't wrong. help someone. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it, the facts aren't the facts, mm -hmm. that that's true, that you do have more power, that Jen did wanna... have the the smarts, the ability, the right. strength. And to I don't do want to live in a world where, where helping people is not what we do. You right. Know? Yeah, it's seen as a bad thing or a solely selfish thing. The thing that that quote points out is how much Joe Jr. carried it with him in every moment. It wasn't, I think that if he did it for strategic, was, yes. exactly. If he did it for strategic reasons, it wouldn't have been such a part of who he was. Right, it would be more like a turn on, turn off. Exactly. Kind of when you're in, around okay, the right I just people. need to act this out because mm -hmm. this is what I need to do because I want to do this other thing. It wasn't. It was who he was every moment of every day, even when people were just trying to have fun with him and just trying to talk to him. Yeah. He like couldn't get out of that seriousness. Yeah. And it was, I think it was something that nobody else in the Kennedy family had to that degree. Maybe Bobby. I but in a different closely, way, more, a, more of a gentle helper way and less a hero yeah. way. And that might just be due to birth order. I was trying to think earlier what Enneagram Joe Jr. was. I was thinking a three, but then I was like, no, it's not a three. Because I was thinking, oh, he does a lot to look good and to, to make the family look good. And he is about like praise and rising to the occasion and being the teacher's pet. And he could have been like a three wing too because he could. He also had that helper side with his parents. He helped his parents so much and his siblings. He was like the ultimate big brother. So he was there. Yeah. He definitely had that fatherly caretaker, um, mentor, instructor. Mm -hmm, patient. Mm -hmm. Element in him. And, and actually we talked about in episode one, I think, one or two that maybe it was episode two actually. That he was like that with all of his younger siblings, but not so much with Jack. Jack, yeah. Jack, Jack was, was like, like the exception to the rule. Yeah. And I see that constantly in their relationship mm -hmm. that Jack was the exception. That there was something about Jack that I think it was mostly just like a, a childlike view of, I have all of this pressure and you don't. I'm envious of you. Yeah. Kind of. He did have a lot like, of that. I respect my myself and I if I could choose to be the oldest, I would still choose it, but I'm still envious of the lack of responsibility and the right. carefree attitude that you get to have. Yeah, that I he's don't. jealous. Yeah, but it was just like a more and plain and simple, him. just sibling. He didn't want to change any of it. Yeah, it just, it just still bothered him sometimes. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, and more so, I think he just wanted acknowledgement of that. Oh, that oh, acknowledgement. 
goes a million miles. Because, yeah, I don't think that he didn't want his role. I don't think that he didn't want his responsibilities. But he just wanted to be appreciated for it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. He wanted to be to, seen. To people to acknowledge how how big of a load it was. Yeah. And that he was happy and willing to carry it. But he wanted... Like, everyone <laughs> wants me. someone to know. That everyone wants people to I, know. Our family always used to make fun of me all growing up. That I always wanted the credit for things. Cassie, and like, yeah, loves a good credit. If I wanted, If it was my idea, I want the credit. If I did something without being asked, I want the freaking credit. Mm-hmm. And I... I'm not like complaining because I had to do it. Like I wanted to do it, but I also want someone to just tell me good job. (laughs) Yeah, literally still like that. You're just better at communicating it. I have no shame. He was like, I shouldn't feel this way. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't freaking care. I want someone to pat me on the back. Mm -hmm. That's funny. The oldest children. Yep. I also think something that that shows in a very clear example, Joe Jr., with the things that he said versus his actions fighting against the things that he said, the Kennedys changed their minds a lot and they allowed themselves to look stupid kind of sometimes and drop their pride to actually absorb truth, reevaluate and change their mind. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of them digging their heels in and being stubborn and prideful and absolutely just neglecting the truth or neglecting the fact that they need to change. Yeah. I most of the time see them leaning in. The only time that I see that is with the affairs, like with the sexual relationships with Joe Jun- or with Joe Sr., Bobby, Jack. Mm-hmm. They just never, they never disagreed with that. And they never thought it was actually wrong or actually evil. I just feel like, it, I don't even know if that's true. I don't know if that's true. Maybe. I just feel like it was like, I feel like they thought it was like one quote pass unquote to themselves wrong. or one, like I'm a human. I'm allowed to, to be stupid in this one area because look at the freaking rest of my life. Look what I've given. Look what I, I don't know. I don't see any evidence of remorse even at all. Like a little bit. Like, I think that if you feel like that, even in close quarters, you're going to be like, I'm sorry. You and then you was, keep doing it. But I haven't researched Bo- how Bobby I haven't gotten or how super Ethel into Bobby yet. Acted about it. But I've seen no evidence of them ever being like, I know, but I'm sorry. There's one quote from Jackie that says, I don't care how many girls Jack sleeps with as long as he knows, or as long as I know that he knows that it's wrong. That's the only thing I've ever seen. And that's her saying that. I don't know that he actually thought it was wrong. I think he just thinks, other people aren't okay with this, but I am. And that's and that's my decision. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's like you. Like certain things, you're you're just like, I get that the rule is no gum in class, but I think that's stupid, so I'm gonna chew gum. You didn't think it was wrong. You got that that was the rule and you got that other people thought it was wrong, but you didn't think it was wrong. So it wasn't wrong to you. And you just kept doing it. It wasn't like, it's just so I'm wild sorry to me for that chewing that's... gum. Like I feel bad, but I'm just gonna do it anyways because I really like gum. No, it was like, the rule is stupid. I don't agree with it. So I'm going to shoot gum, you know? Just such an extreme thing that, to me, is such an extreme thing. But when you think about the way that they grew up. Yeah, I get that. It was never extreme to them. It was never abnormal to them. Well, like, you can't tell me that they didn't see Rose in pain about it and hating it. They were aware. Like, they knew yeah. that, that this act causes pain and also the Bible says not to do it. Yeah, that's true. So the Bible says, says not, not to do it like over and over. If you read Matthew and Proverbs, every chapter has stay away and from they were adultery. Going to mass. <laughs> adultery is wrong. Warning against adultery. And they were going to mass every single day growing up. Yeah. And so. their mom made it known that she was bothered by it. Especially the oldest. Jack had to have known. Bobby makes a little bit more sense to me because I don't know. Rose was like how much she resigned about that, to it. Though. Be- I know that, that she said like you're dad thinks the little women should stay Mm -hmm. confined to the house or to the kitchen or whatever. I know she was irritated with a lot of the neglect, but I don't know if she openly talked about the affairs because she wouldn't even openly admit admit the affairs to herself or her friends or anything like that. You know, Mm, that's true. And I guess as a kid, you're not putting like two and two together. Like, oh, my mom feels neglected because my dad keeps spending his time on random chicks. And especially with how emotionally closed off Rose was. Mm -hmm, That's true. I guess they had to have known it was wrong. They just didn't understand the pain of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But one of the instances where they definitely did open their eyes, look around, 
take it in, think about it, mull over it, and then make a different decision was when Jack hadn't seen Rosemary in over a decade. People were writing to him when he was a senator, hey, we really need more attention on intellectual disabilities and um, the disability community in general. And he was, as far as we can tell, ignoring that. I don't know how much of that he actually was exposed to, but he didn't do anything about it. And people were saying we're trying to get in contact with the Kennedys. And then he goes and sees Rosemary once his dad suggests it. And from then on, it's a totally different story. So it's kind of a public laying down of your pride, realizing, okay, I was wrong about this. I need to make a different decision and Right. However it looks. Almost bringing to light a fault of yours or a flaw of yours. Yeah. Something that you did wrong and being okay with. However that looks. Because yeah. Because the, the point was something needed to be done about it. And that happens over and over and over again. One of them is obviously Joe. Joe, Joe Jr., Jr. Changing his opinion. The whole family with Rosemary, honestly, all of them. Yeah, you're right. Even Joe Sr. and Rose. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, they publicly, literal quotes. it. Yeah, talk about how they changed their minds Mm -hmm. and they were wrong. Yeah. And admitting that. And then with Bobby in the future and then with Teddy in the future, that might be like the most distinct, just full turnaround. Redemption story. Mm -hmm. But all of them were like that, which is so I think it's because of the way that Joe Sr. raised them. Right. They were supposed to mess up. That was their job as kids. Failing was not the enemy. Mm -mm. Failing is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Right. It was encouraged. It was like, okay, we're making money moves. Let's go. This might be the best thing Mm -hmm. that ever happened to you. It meant you had an opportunity. You took that opportunity. So what what happened? That was not the point. And move on. Even with Jack and his speeches in the... In the future with his political career, he kind of sucks. <laughs> and that to to Joe Sr., that wasn't the point. It was like, no, you did amazing. Let's see how we can make it better. But yep, you have the experience, which so. is something that I have worked on in my life. And I want to continue to keep moving forward in that mm-hmm. is yeah. not seeing failure as failure. Which you would think that they would be super prideful because when I think of a rich, powerful family, mm-hmm. But that's also a testament to how unconventional and weird their beliefs were because, I mean, it's everyone's first instinct to be prideful and Mm -hmm. to not admit when you're wrong. Even as a little kid, you don't have to be taught to- Every personality To lie and to hide. (gasps) Yeah. Yeah. And to not want to get in trouble. Right. So with the whole Joe Sr. holding Jack back, not wanting him to get hurt or- to lose him in World War II. That to me is the fatherly, like loving, emotional, human part of Joe Sr. that I feel like a ton of people miss. And I think that we've done a pretty good job at showing that side of him and how much his kids loved and adored their father Mm -hmm. and how much their father loved and adored and cared for his kids on a, on a familial level, not on a like power hunger, not on a like success driven Yeah, I think he saw the value in them, not only as people who could be successful, but he saw the value in them as people. As who they were in that moment. Not who they could become, but who they actually were. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just protecting their potential. Right. He was protecting them as their- as, As his kids. His children, yeah. And I think that's a very plain example of that. And one that honestly would have would have hurt them career wise would have hurt them success wise because Jack and Joe were both like oh I need to do something in this war and I need to not take the easy route out because of image and they were definitely and perception that was one of the reasons why they did fight and did for so long and went on such risky I missions, don't even think no I think it was why they fought and why they wanted to be in combat I don't think it was why Joe Jr. stayed out there that long you don't think that was any any part of the reason? I think his competitive nature a little bit wanted that award and that pride. Yeah. But, I do, yeah, I do think that their personality, much, they were so freaking driven and so... Because I don't even think that that would have helped his image. He already fought enough to like get the image status, I feel like. But you don't think that he wanted some sort of like award... I don't know. I feel like he did. I mean, no, no, no. I I know he wanted the award. I just don't know 
to me, it just seems more like I want the award because I'm competitive and I want that pride, not as much for like the newspapers, but I could be wrong. I, I feel like it's just, yeah, that self inner competitiveness, even with Jack. Like I need to do better. I need mm-hmm. to be a better person. I need to yes be the best at this. Not, I want this published in the newspaper. I feel like that was more his dad. Yeah, that's true. I feel like Joe Jr. more so compared to me, I was about thinking, just oh, getting well, the award and being worthy of the award. Being competitive is still about perception, but it's not necessarily. Because in that letter after Joe Jr. dies, when Jack is talking to- Yes, Harold Lasky. Yeah, he- He mentions how much other people genuinely being better at something- Bothered the crap out of him. Yeah. It's like the movie Rush, if you've ever seen Rush. Yeah. It's those those two drivers- didn't really, I don't think, compete for the public, for the the newspapers, for the media. Well, no, they were kind of a little bit. I think it was more of a genuine competition between each other to see who was better. And like in the end, yes. But I think and like, for what is his name, Chris Hemsworth, a little bit at the beginning, definitely no, for the I girls, think for the it life was for style. the girls, and yeah, for, that's perception. That's how girls view you. Okay, well, whatever. that is definitely still perception at the beginning. I do not think it ended that way. But the other dude, fully, fully, fully the, just for himself. The other dude is more what I see Joe Jr. And Jack is Chris Hemsworth. Yes, I would agree with that. And so I just, I feel like he just wanted to be the best. Yeah, so I guess the comparison between, uh, that's like a good- And not be viewed as the best. He wanted to be the best. And other people genuinely being better than him or doing more than him rubbed him the wrong way to his core. He would just disappoint himself. Yeah, exactly. And it would be something that he couldn't. He didn't want to live with that disappointment, feeling like he left before he needed to. Also circling back to Joe Sr.'s perspective on it, I think that if he was motivated by potential and career and what it was going to do for their image, because you could say, oh, well, he was protecting them because if you- Protect their future. If you have dead sons, you can't do a whole lot with dead sons, can't can't uh, accomplish much. We see him do really strategic things to try to protect Jack and hold Jack back over and over and over. And Jack even said the best thing for Joe Jr., which they're all trying to get Joe Jr. to be president, that we're all focused on Joe Jr. Protect Joe Jr. at all costs. If you want somebody who's going to go on and show your family honor and impress everyone and do the most, it's Joe Jr. Mm -hmm. If he was actually just motivated by that, he would have let Jack go die as a war hero. Oh, for sure. That would have been like the ticket to the White House. So for them. So him protecting his sickly little son who's not going to do anything. Right. Who literally can't even make it through freaking college. (laughs) Who can't make it through a semester or a month of college. Without going to the hospital. Like barely walk. Sacrificing him wouldn't have hurt him that much. So him trying to protect his sickly little son who doesn't, who's not going to do anything. Yeah. Was not and not the protecting move. Joe Jr. is that doesn't line up with the whole. Oh, he was just protecting their potential. He had no inkling of a thought, and he even that, Joe, he that even, Jack could be president. He no. even says that later on. I literally didn't think I had it. He had it in him, yep. like at Next all. Episode, like I would have bet money that 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 kid was not going to become anything because he was so sick and so shy and so not Joe Jr. Like him compared to Joe Jr. was such a letdown for them laughable. career-wise. And it even said uh, one of his friends um, wrote to him after he got mm-hmm. drafted and he was like, that's you getting drafted ever. is the funniest thing that's ever happened to me in my, in my entire life. I love that. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> it, because we can't see Jack like that because we know JFK, mm-hmm. but he just was not JFK. But something I feel like we haven't touched on enough is the difference, which we did a little bit when they were a lot younger, the difference between Jack and Joe Jr., their personalities. But if you really sit there and think about it, okay, Joe Jr. is this all-star boy. If anyone could win all-around boy every single year, it would be Joe. Yeah. Like he was perfect with academics, with personality, with his peers, with his teachers, sports, in the home. He was like the perfect Politics. oldest brother. He just hung the moon. Joe Jr., it just poured out of him. His flight school instructor even said, Jack, or sorry, Joe Jr. was a natural. 
Jack, they are pouring every resource, every encouragement, every medication. They're sending him to the Florida winter home to rest up. They're sending him to Stanford to, to get some vitamin D in the sun. They didn't have to do any of that for Joe Jr. He just, he just produced, he performed. It just came out of him. And Jack, they're like trying to give him every resource and every help possible to to hopefully do something yeah become something exactly. and they're like you know what whatever whatever you end up becoming that'll just that'll be, be fine. fine because clearly kid you have issues and we're gonna try to help it was you just like as much Jack, as we can though. to try to be like half of a person joe jr said it and one of jack's um tutors said it i th- it was either in high school i think it might have been at choate you know, he shows some potential, mm-hmm. but he doesn't really have any of his own thoughts or any of his own ideas. And then Joe Jr. said with his thesis, like, it shows a lot of work, but you didn't really prove anything. You didn't have any original ideas. Mm-hmm. And you even said it at the end of the episode that Jack was always protected by yep. Joe Jr. Because, if not only because Joe Jr. was the one that was taking the brunt of all of the pressure, of all of the expectations, Mm -hmm. and the limelight was always on him. Today is not the day. This is horrible. You don't remember how bad recording episode seven was. No, not the the footage. I'm not saying the episode. I'm saying this is just not good. And now, to ensure that you stay well fed, here is your conspiracy of the week. Inga binga. Was she a Nazi spy or was she just addicted to love? Let's get into Inga Binga and her relationship with Jack Kennedy. So do you think she was a Nazi spy? I could see her being useful to Hitler. (laughs) Yeah. Not only would she be able to get intel about the U.S. from the Kennedy family because they were in the military, but also she would be able to get information about Great Britain because Joe Kennedy was the ambassador. Like I could see her targeting JFK, you know what I mean? Wooing him on purpose. This is her writing about Hitler. You immediately like him. The eyes, showing a kind heart, stare right at you. They sparkle with force. So I think she just loved to fall in love with powerful men. (laughs) That is terrifying. Mm, But look, they make the same case for her that we made for Joe Jr. To be fair, Ferris points out that this is not quite as outrageous as it sounds, as it was the mid-30s. A lot of people were fascinated by Hitler in 1936. No one could envision the Holocaust at this point. Hitler even gave Arvid an autographed picture of himself signed to Inga Arvid in friendly memory. Wow. Yeah, people just absolutely didn't see it. No, Hitler was just a freaking mastermind. Mm -hmm. And he got there because he was so likable. Right, exactly. Nobody who's that vile and disgusting on first, like, noticeably, recognizably evil like that is going to be able to become that powerful. Unless they were born into it. And have that much influence. I don't even think. Yeah, I think that if you're born into it, then yeah. Like, everyone has to... I mean, I guess if you look at certain dynasties, of course. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. That has already happened. Yeah, you're right. I feel like she's like the political Marilyn Monroe. She was involved with like Arthur Miller, Joe DiMaggio, like all these famous entertainers. Mm -hmm. And she was involved with all these famous political Political men. What are you doing? I think it was all just circumstance and happenstance. Yes, I agreed. But I could definitely create a narrative. <laughs> if she wanted to be a spy, she totally could yeah. have, though. I just feel like she wasn't motivated. She was like a gossip, gossip columnist, and then... I think she liked attention yes. from powerful people. Yeah, but she wasn't there to hunt and kill. No. And- because I feel like there would have been effects of that, you know? Mm, yeah, more proof. Yeah. But I also feel like she actually did just like him a lot. For sure. Like, love him. Yeah. She also wasn't with Jack. She was with Jack before he was president, so... And she was yeah, with Hitler but- before he was Hitler, pretty much, so... But there's something about that. There's a common denominator there well, for, for sure. sure. The demeanor, I'm sure. Yeah. Not saying that Jack was anything like Hitler. <laughs> Just that charisma, confidence, dip- going places. Diplomacy. Yeah. The air of power, which we will get to discuss so much more in Jackie's episode. I just finished the script for it and I'm pretty excited to get back to the story that I already know. You know what I mean? Because we we were able to cover Jackie 
in uh, season one, Mm -hmm. but in season two, now with the Kennedys, we're able to like look at the other side of it. And this side is massive. Like we barely scratched the surface. In season one, I tried to stick as closely as I could just to Jackie and Lee because we were like, this is a sibling podcast. It's about Jackie. It's about Lee. It's not about the Kennedys. It's not about JFK. That's a whole can of worms. Yeah. Well, now we're in the can of worms. Yes. And the worms that we've found, oh my gosh. I'm also excited to a little bit compare Inga and Jackie because- Yes. Inga was Jack's like first- love. Uh And I want to compare their demeanor and their personality a little bit, but also I'm excited to go down the rabbit hole of was Jack actually in love with Jackie? And I know there are so many opinions on this and was he for a little bit and then fell out of love with her? Did he just love her like a friend? Was she actually a priority for him? Did Jackie actually love Jack or was she just power hungry? There's a lot of like conspiracies. That's exactly the conversation that I want to have. I cannot wait to freaking dissect their dynamic and their feelings. And I feel like now that I've gotten to know Jack so much better, I feel like I know him even better than Jackie. Uh, Yeah, agreed. It's like, I feel like I know Jackie. And then there are some quotes from her that I'm like, whoa, what? But she has some contradicting quotes. And I've, and there's actually- She probably just is so emotional that she like just- there's like sh- Lee and yes. she just, with whatever she feels in that moment, she says. And okay, it's a little bit more concealed thoughts. with Jackie, but with Lee, it's always that way. And with Jackie, you just have to get her at her right weak moment exactly, where she's like- where you get to see uh, yeah. past the surface. Okay, I have so many thoughts and I cannot talk about them. I don't want to spoil my script because I worked really hard on it. But so, just get But excited. get ready because we're going to talk about the Jackie in the Kennedy family. And that is a side of Jackie that we have not- discussed or uncovered at all. Right, because we- with oh my gosh. Truly with the Kennedys, the best is yet to come. And I'm just like, I'm salivating, ready to talk about it. I don't know though. We literally ended last episode by crying, so. Oh gosh. (laughs) It's already been (gasps) up and down. Yeah, that's true. Such a freaking roller. roller Like we literally have already lost two. But see, okay. Two. We've lost two out of the four oldest siblings. Oh my gosh. And just brace yourselves for the next months to go. Yeah. Yeah. But- What I'm saying is those were like really important episodes and very impactful and emotional, but they weren't fun. And I feel like later we're going to get to the Just like the juicy, fun, gossipy. And I really enjoyed in the Bouvier episodes getting to discuss the relational dynamics. What were they thinking? Why would they do this? Oh, Lee should have done this. Right. And I I feel like we could have even gone more Way down more. that. Yeah. Especially with their parents, the freaking parents, insane yeah. dynamic and what they set up for them. I feel like I'm still digesting. Oh, that makes sense why Jackie was that way. Or that makes sense why Lee was so like that because exactly. of their childhood. So because I enjoyed that so much in the Bouviers, I'm really itching to get there mm-hmm. with this story too. That's probably been like from season one, the most popular parts too. The Bouvier sisters? The Bouvier sisters dynamic and dissecting all of that. And people have even said, okay, this makes me kind of see my sister relationship. I know, which is surprising to me because I feel like their relationship is so extreme and one that I haven't ever been around anyone. All the sibling relationships that I know, they're either like Walt and Roy and just BFFs, soulmates, just ride or die. Never changing, just loyal as crap. Yeah. Best friends. Or they just like don't really talk. Eh, we get along as adults. We get along more now than we did as kids, but they're not each other's best friends. Right. They see each other for like holidays and family events and whatever. Yeah. I don't know anyone who just absolutely love hate relationship mm-hmm. to their core. No. But y'all are because, out there, so DM us. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, and maybe it's the um, higher classes because hey, there's more so of a much more expectation, Yeah, first of all. And then, yeah, it's more of a luxury for sure. And also, obviously, image is a lot more of a foundational element in like a higher class society. Also, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, for sure, Joe Sr. paid Inga to walk away. (laughs) These are the questionable decisions that Joe makes. And I'm like, what in the world are you doing? Like, this is just weird. Like, obviously, I don't even think it's questionable. I would totally do that. If I had endless amounts of income and I felt like you're going to ruin my son's life and maybe you're a freaking Nazi spy. Get away from me. Here, take some money. Go Goodbye. It's just so freaking weird. Like, because that's a little extra controlling of your adult kid. 
Do you I know get what I mean? That? Like it's a little, but he's also not overstepping your bounds. I get that, but I also like it think, worked out well for him for sure. But it could have also not. <laughs> you know how many freaking controlling things parents do? Yeah, I know, and they're all questionable to me. They're all a little bit like, mm, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> Is it questionable? One hundred percent. I will agree with you. <laughs> it is questionable. That's something that I struggle but, with. Apparently, I struggle with everything. Do I life. feel like it was the wrong decision? I don't know. Yeah, I. I feel like I just thought it was, oh, that's like weird to just pay someone off. But I think that's weird to do no matter what it is. But maybe that's because I didn't grow up with a bunch of money and it, I never I, used money as like a power tool. You know I what I mean? Like it was just- ethical no matter what. But but uh, but now that you're saying it like that, it's like, oh, that kind of does make sense. Yeah. But I just don't, that's not my first If you've experienced enough instinct. life and you realize the consequence that relationships can have on people yes. and the cost that yeah. they can have, literally a girl on TikTok- her sister got with a boy when she was really young and she shouldn't have been with a boy who was a few years older than her and it cost her her life. Yeah. I would pay him. Yeah, for sure. As much as he freaking would, it, yeah. it would take to make him go away. And I still but think I'm it's sure technically it's unethical. Of, I'm sure most rich people do that kind of stuff. They pay to get in, into college. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just seems so bizarre. I mean, it is. Go away, problem. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> It's also interesting from Inga's perspective, you can see in real time, Bethany pointed this out, that every person, even in real time, not even looking back, they knew the gravity of the bond of the Kennedy family. Inga, writing to Jack, said that she didn't want to get in between him and his father and hurt the Kennedy clan at all because- She knew how fiercely he belonged to the Kennedy clan or something, something like, like that. that. But- it's just such a theme that no matter how old the person is that's around them, no matter yeah. what relationship there it was, they all acknowledged how loyal and how unique their family dynamic was. How special it was and that it deserved to be protected uh -huh. in a way. You weren't just like sons and daughters. You were a member of the Kennedy family. Yeah, and that was your loyalty and your love and your priority over your and your birth lover, right. over your best friend, over whoever it was, mm -hmm. it was and kind of similar that, to the Ringling Brothers. Yes. Oh my gosh, you were more loyal to your brothers than you were your spouse. You mm -hmm. were more loyal to your siblings because even the the sister, mm -hmm. whenever one of the brothers died, his house and his possessions were taken away from his, his wife, wife and given to his sister <laughs> and his, her family. Yeah, because it belongs to the Ringling family. And when when she when not Ida, to that person, right? And when Ida married Ida. someone that this the brothers didn't approve of, they didn't talk to her for a year until she had a kid, and then there were <laughs> she was like back in the family because blood calls for blood. Oh my gosh, it's just so fascinating. These. These siblings, and I think that we're literally never going to get a sibling dynamic that is like not interesting because these yeah. are obviously siblings in extreme situations. They're not everyday like Joe Schmo, whatever. They, and even then, I think all people are interesting. Probably, yeah. Like, I truly believe, yes, everyone is interesting. And if those people can be honest enough with themselves and with their family members, that is fascinating. But it's like you never get to go that deep with most people because it's so... Their secrets are so protected. Nobody's ignored. writing books on them because yeah. why would you? <laughs> exactly. The Ringling Brothers story is also very fascinating and maybe it has something to do with the fact that there's so many of them all doing yeah, so the same it thing. It creates this like hive mentality. Yes. Because whenever there's only two of you, it's like, okay, you can be super loyal, but you just have a close relationship. It doesn't feel like this army of people. Yeah. And like what's right and what's wrong. I don't know. It's just so influenced by culture right. and society. And I think it's just a personal choice wherever you want to put. Yeah. And it's however, however the stars align, like however the ducks fall. That's not the, that's not the saying. What is it? However the something falls. The stones fall. Oh yeah. The cards fall. However they lay. <laughs> But you know what I'm trying to say? And I feel like they're, okay, I, it depends I'm on, on a backpedal. It, it depends on how you feel, but it also depends on your family members. If someone is super toxic and you can't handle that, then obviously that's. Yeah, I don't know because I don't really think it was right the way that they treated their in-laws and they had plenty You're to talking about the ringlings. The ringlings, yes. Like, for sure, yeah, I agree. I just don't feel like that was the right thing to do for sure. It was more of like a scarcity mindset, but I think that was carried over from their childhood of poverty. 
for sure. And, and I, they, I, they also had that, like, it's us against the yes, world. Yes, I was going to say, they had to create that for themselves as well. But why wasn't she with included this, in that? With the scarcity mindset of us against the world, because we must not know enough about their relationship. Because she was the one who was literally, she was the snake charmer when they needed one. She cooked all the oh, meals that for was everybody. That That's her. Hmm. So it's like, what happened? She should, I, in my mind, she should have been one of them. Mm-hmm. She was there before even two of the brothers were on the circus team. Wasn't she the one that was also keeping the brothers from seeing each other when they were dying? No. That wasn't her? That uh-uh. was a different wife? Yes. That was Charles' wife. Charles and John, the last, the last two. two. Mm-hmm. Al was the first one to die. Uh-huh. And he's the one who they freaking took everything from. Yeah, that was Al. That was Al and Lou. Yeah. Uh, Lou, Louise. Yeah. She should have been a sibling. So. That's weird. I don't know. I feel like I'm missing a little bit of that story. Yeah, me too. There's a lot missing from that. There's not a lot documented back then. I know. I'm, I feel kind of sad about it. I'm grateful that the nephew wrote the book because mm-hmm. that's like how we know half of that or mm-hmm. more than half of that stuff is just somebody who was there. Also, something from Inga's story is Jack's version of being rebellious and his act of revenge on his parents was going to be hosting a Bible study. Like, what in the world? That's just so freaking weird. Who and would come up with that? I think it was because he knew his mom so well that he's like, the one thing that is the thing with her that's going to actually pierce her soul is spirituality and and God, her relationship with God. Mm-hmm. So how can I poke at that? And to, to me, Jack seems like a rebellious kid, but people don't act like that in like historians and stuff, when they're talking about the Kennedy siblings, they say that Kick was really the only rebellious daughter. That's crazy. The one who actually did something that yes. she wasn't, which is supposed true. to do and wasn't supposed to, like she, she's the only one who didn't fall in line. And of course, all of them are kids and all of them are humans and they but all strayed a little bit, but not much. She went against the their core beliefs. Yes, and something that was like a slap did. to the face of the family. Something and that they actually cared about. The yes. Kennedys like didn't care about a lot of face value, like rules. Like Janet Bouvier, Jackie's mom, cared right. very much so about social etiquette and the thing how things Getting looked embarrassed and, and manners and, yes. and all of that. Joe and Rose, nah. Mm-mm. So the things that were actually important to them were the big things. Yes. And the only people who, or the only person who went against that, you're right, is Kick. Yeah. And that kind of opened up my eyes because I feel like Jack is a quintessential playboy and he is just there to have the fun. Prankster. Going to parties. Yeah. Pranking everyone. Getting kicked out of school. <laughs> exactly. Forming clubs at school and then getting kicked out. But it wasn't, yeah, to the family. It's like that stuff really didn't matter. Kick was the only one who went Basically, like backstabbed the whole family. Yeah, and none of Jack the rest was of them did. rebellious against society. Yes, but not his parents. No, which makes me excited to get into kick. Wow, that's eye opening. That was a really good point. I I would totally say that Jack was the rebel. Yeah, he, he doesn't. Wasn't. He seemed like the quintessential, especially compared to Joe and Eunice and Bobby. Yeah, I mean, because he did totally disregard lots of rules. Yeah, and he was like the most, one of the most playful. And he did not play by the rules. And like as a president, he freaking. Right. Yeah. Did all kinds of things that were like, mm, that's but pretty taboo. Family, it was still within the constraints. What was acceptable. That, yeah. Well, yeah, it was like he he still lived by their world. What's that called? Paradigm. Everything he did was in line with that still. Something that we mentioned in the episode, but we didn't get very far into was Jackie versus Jack's firsthand experience with World War II. Because like we discussed in the Bouvier episodes, Jackie went to France to study abroad after college. And she was able to see a lot of the after effects in France that were still... Yeah, a lot of the economic impact as well, because the person that she stayed with, remember, she lost her husband. Yes. In, was it in the actual Holocaust? Right, exactly. There was a lot of like remaining consequences from the war that Jackie saw that were still very, very, very raw. And it was only five to six years after World War II had ended. It was like 1950-ish. So Jackie, right after college, goes to study abroad in France. And she wanted to obviously study academics and literature and stuff. But she also was taking advantage of being in France and and wanted to experience the culture and the art scene. Right. 
And that's actually where she got a lot of her love for French culture, couture, food, fashion. She loved that side of it so much that she ended up taking Lee a with her a time. few years later. Yeah, mm-hmm. which, yeah, just go listen to this episode if you want. Go haven't. listen. That, that, that is a really, really cool. And that was like the best time of their life. Like they, yeah. that's when they were just best friends. But Jackie okay. goes to France. She stays with a host family. And the only reason that this host family is was host. taking students was because of World War II. So this is a countess. She, well, actually, I don't even know if she was a countess. She was something like that. She was something like that, but it she- seemed like she would, should have been really rich, which she was. Her house was like freaking bomb. She was, but her husband had died in World War II. He literally ended up getting taken to a concentration camp, which she was taken to a camp as well. Yes. But she survived Mm -hmm. and her husband was killed just right before World War II ended. So because of that, she was- um, She lost his finance. Yeah. Financial support. And the economy was doing horrible, obviously, after the war. And so to make more money, she- Opened her home as a host for students who would come from America or wherever and study abroad. There was rubble in the streets. There were rations on coffee, on coal. So the house was frigid mm-hmm. in the winters. It felt very apocalyptic and like, we don't know what's going to happen. So I think that she really enjoyed being able to teach young people about French culture and what she loved about her country and things like that. It kind of seemed like she realized the gravity of what was happening current mm-hmm. time. And how much, how pivotal of a point it was too. Right. So Jackie got to see that and she even went to Germany and I think she saw mm-hmm. like the first concentration yes. camp ever She built. walked around after obviously the war was over for a few years, but I can't imagine what it looked like. Yeah, the the destruction was massive. So it's going to take decades to really clean all of it up and actually restore the city. Right. But she saw it five years after. It was essentially a ghost town. And although all of the people were obviously gone, everything, it was like everything, everyone just evaporated. And so it it very much felt active, like alive almost. Does that make sense? Yeah. It wasn't like walking around a museum where there's so much distance between what had happened. It was pain, raw pain. Yes. And even the concentration camp, I mean, they had gone through, obviously there weren't bodies and stuff like that. And they had sanitized the place, but she said, even empty as it was, you could feel the presence. Yeah. Like the darkness. You could feel the the evil just hanging in the air. And mind you, she's obviously, there's a huge age gap between, well, I say huge, it's like 12 12 years. But when you're that young, it feels huge. I mean, she was born in 1929. So when the, so when Jack shipped off to war in 1941, she's 12. Jeez. Cause 39. Yeah. She's like 12 years old. Yeah. So she's literally in elementary school, like fifth grade or sixth grade. (laughs) And he is going off to war. And he's literally fighting for our country. So, so Jackie saw all of the aftermath, that quiet, just destruction and emptiness and loss. Yes. It's like she experienced the grief stage Mm -hmm. as a 20 something. Jack as a 20 something saw the damage happen Mm -hmm. and saw the violence. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really interesting to look at them as a couple and look at their combined perspective because I think that they both, and we will discuss this because we kind of get into the dynamic of their relationship and the emotional temperament of both of them. But I think that there's a depth to Jack and Jackie that gets often overlooked and is often misunderstood or just not perceived, you know? Uh They were both a lot more emotional than they seem. And a lot more deep. And oh my gosh, in the affair episode, guys, I'm reading right now, just just to get you a little excited. I'm reading a memoir right now of one of Jack's lovers. Yeah. Yeah. um, Mistresses. And the things that she shares about Jack Kennedy in private are a little weird and a little Does it make him look bad or? It's like, oh, what? Like, who are you? What happened to you? Can I just tell you right now? Sure. <laughs> he had <laughs> <laughs> And people used to write about <laughs> with his mistress. That's so freaking weird. As a 40-something-year-old. What's going on? You know? Yeah. That's a little 
That's why. That, but that's that is what bothered me about that one quote. And I'm telling you, it there is there's some something sort in of him. yeah. And they said that the compartmentalization. They said nobody ever knew Jack Kennedy. Nobody ever fully knew him. Everybody knew sides of him and they felt like they knew that side of him intimately. Uh But nobody ever got the full picture of who Jack Kennedy was. That affair book is so interesting. It does. Isn't that weird? That is so weird. What is that? That's what I'm telling you. Like, have you studied anything like that? That's freaking weird. I mean, just like... Anyway, we're getting into Jack's some really favorite. interesting things. No. Jack was never my favorite. Eunice was my favorite for a little bit. Rosemary was my favorite. I love Jack the most consistently, I think, throughout the story. Bobby is the best one, clearly. <coughs> Joe Jr. was never my favorite. Pat will never be my favorite. <laughs> Jean will never be my favorite. Teddy, I'm sorry. Kicked for sure, no. <laughs> uh-uh. <laughs> I'm excited to learn more about Kick, though, too, because I'm so confused. By I'm her. not. I'm so confused by her. What were you doing, Kit? <laughs> so Jackie saw the grief and the kind of the loss after the fact, like we said. But Jack saw the violence of it. So just remember that for the the upcoming episodes when he's president and he's making these huge decisions because he, from personal experience, knows what war really looks like and he knows what war costs. He knows the cost of that decision. Mm -hmm. And he never forgot it. Join us here next week to hear about Kick's undoing and the first crack in the Kennedy clan. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind-the-scenes footage. To keep up with us day-to-day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business.